here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. And thank you, everybody who's uh, joining us. Um, so as Sue had mentioned today, we're going to be talking about um, the aging eye. And I'm going to just be reviewing some very common um, things that happen to our eyes um, as we get older, just sort of, uh, of, of some very common diseases and processes, some of which you've probably heard of, some of which you may not have. Um, I also want to offer a little um, a little warning in advance. My dog is here, and if the Amazon truck comes by, she's going to start barking. So <laughs> just, just a heads up. Um, so um, let me see. Oh, it's, uh -oh, it's not letting me advance my slide. Let me see. Hmm. Hold on one. Just second. make sure your uh, cursor is on the slide. Okay. See if that sometimes it's funny that way. Oh, there it goes. Thank there you. There you go. I know I have the same problem okay. sometimes. Okay. <laughs> so the topics we're going to be talking about today are uh, the handful of things from computer vision sy uh, syndrome to dry eyes, cataracts and macular degeneration, and then um, and then as Sue had mentioned, I'll, I'll have, we'll have some time at the end to answer um, some questions. Um, so the the first topic I want to talk about is something um, that's really become uh, come to the forefront during the pandemic with everybody on Zoom meetings and things like this, um, which is computer vision syndrome. Um, so a lot of uh, there's been a lot of talk the last couple of years about blue blocking glasses and blue light. But actually, blue light from computers isn't really responsible for uh, the trouble that we have when we're on our computers or screens for an extended time. Um, the causes of, of these uh, difficulty um, when, with computer use, um, including eye strain and irritation, um, are actually a couple of other things. One is that when we're on a screen, um, a computer a device, or even just reading a book, our blink rate is significantly lower than what it normally is. So our eyes tend to get dry just from not blink blinking frequently enough. Um, we can also get eye strain just from staring for an extended time, um, and the eye muscles that help us kind of focus close up can kind of be, get out of focus from that. Um, and we also can experience glare and contrast from the computer screen. Um, so what can we do about it? The blue blocking lights um, are probably not harmful, but they're all, they're not harmful, but they're probably not very helpful either. Um, so we recommend a few things. One is something called the 2020 rule, which you may have heard about. And what that means is we recommend when you're on the computer device for an extended time, Take a break every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away or more, like out a window um, for about 20 seconds. Um, the other is that even if you don't really have dry eyes to begin with, if you spend a significant amount of time on a screen, it's a good idea to use artificial teardrops like Sistane or Refresh, um, over-the-counter artificial teardrops when you're, uh, when you're using a device uh, from time to time because the eyes will get dry. Um, and also make sure your computer um, or laptop monitor is, uh, is is far back enough that it's a comfortable distance. Typically somewhere between 23 to 25 inches is good. Um, and then avoid using a screen close to bedtime um, be, as that can really interfere with our circadian rhythms. And that is the one indication where using blue filtering lenses may, is actually probably helpful um, because that blue light can uh, does stimulate our pineal gland, um, which can mess with our, our sleep rhythms. So the best thing is just to avoid using a screen close to bedtime. And if you do have to use a phone or screen close to bedtime, using the nighttime mode, which shifts um, some of that blue away from the screen. Um, so just in the rapid fire succession of uh, things that we're going to talk about that can affect our eyes as we start to get older, the next thing I want to talk about is, is reading glasses. Um, so most people um, who, unless you're nearsighted, will start requiring reading glasses sometime in their 40s. Some people make it a little bit further. Um, and so people are often, often ask us, why, why all of a sudden do I need reading glasses? Um, whereas before I could see everything near distance and everything like that. People complain their arms are no longer uh, long enough to holding things really far away. Um, and so this is a picture of somebody who can no longer read close up. Um, but the reason is something called presbyopia, which is a completely normal process that happens to everybody as our eyes age. And um, when we're younger, the lens in our eye does something called accommodate. There's a muscle around the lens in our eye, which is a structure behind your iris. And that helps you focus close up. When that lens, when that muscle constricts, the lens in our eye actually increases in depth. And that increases the power of the lens, allowing the light to focus um, from closer objects. So the, the function of those muscles around the lens starts to stiffen and deteriorate, starting, believe it or not, in our late 30s. Um, and it just progressively gets worse and worse and worse um, until um, usually um, it sort of uh, stabilizes and really isn't functioning um, in any capacity to help you focus uh, close up at all by your mid-60s. Um, and the typical symptoms of presbyopia are just 
having to hold things further away, having more difficulty reading, eye strain, uh, headaches with reading for an extended time. Um, and this is just a picture kind of uh, illustrating this entire this process. So you can see on the top picture here, um, when you're looking at an object in the distance, the rays of light go through our cornea where they're bent by the cornea and then by the lens where they're bent further. So they form a focused image on our retina. Um, and so in the image below that, what's happening is that the muscles that can, that constrict the lens are no longer doing that. So the lens is no longer increasing in depth as it is in the, the topmost picture. So the light is focused behind the retina. So the bottom picture, you see a lens, which is a reading lens that's now putting the image in the correct place on the back on the, the retina here. Um, now, if you're nearsighted, you don't, we don't need reading glasses um, many times because when you're nearsighted, it means that your eye is long. So the light is naturally focused in front of your retina. So when you read and you're nearsighted, that actually you're sort of seeing that image in a more appropriate place because it's sort of pulling, you know, the image, um, you know, when you're holding something close up, the focal point is further back, um, is further back and it can be appropriately focused on the retina depending on how nearsighted you are. Um, so how do we treat it? Well, there's a few different options. The, the conventional way of treating it uh, is just over-the-counter reading glasses. Prescription reading glasses, are fine, but if you don't have a significant distance prescription, over-the-counter reading glasses like you get on CVS or you can order a six-pack of them on Amazon um, for probably the same price you can get a single pair at CVS are, are perfectly fine. You really don't need prescription glasses if you don't have a significant uh, astigmatism or nearsighted or farsighted correction. You can also do something called monovision, which can be done with a LASIK or a contact lens, and that's where we correct one eye for near and one eye for distance. Um, it sounds like it wouldn't work, but for probably about 60 to 70% of people, it can work uh, fairly well. Um, our brain will adapt to having one eye for near and one eye for distance pretty effectively much of the time. Um, and a newer option that you may have heard about, something called Viewity Eye Drops. Viewity is a new formulation of a drop that's been around for many, many, many years called pilocarpine. Pilo pilocarpine is a drop that, um, in addition to some other things like lowering the eye pressure, it actually makes the pupil very small and it creates kind of a pinhole effect. And it also has an impact on the lens um, that can help our, help the, the, um, the light sort of focus on the right place. Now, the problem with the Viewity drops, I've tried them. They work, they don't work for a very long time though. They typically, they say it lasts for six to eight hours. In my experience and most of my patient's experience, it really works well for about three or four hours. They're not covered by insurance. They tend to make things dim because our pupils are smaller when you use those drops. So there's less light reaching the back of the eye. And um, when the drop came out, we had some concerns as ophthalmologists. We've, we've always known that pilocarpine drops, there may be a, a small risk of developing a tear in the retina from these. The studies that were used for the approval of this drop didn't show any increased risk of retinal tears, but there have been quite a few case reports now of people using BUD developing retinal tears. It's still, so it can still be used, but if you want to use it, a, uh, a dilated exam is really required beforehand to make sure that your retina is healthy. Um, so that's, that's sort of the long and short of presbyopia. And moving along to the next uh, topic of our aging eyes is dry eyes. So dry eyes, simply put, is when our eyes can, the tears can no longer adequately lubricate our eyes. And it's due to a couple of simple things. One is your eyes are not making enough tears. And actually the more common problem is the tears we make are not working well. So you have a poor quality to the tear film. Um, um, this, about 17% of people suffer from dry eyes is probably higher than that. Um, it's more common in, in women, and it's more common as we get older. Um, the typical symptoms people experience with dry eyes most commonly are things like burning, uh, feeling a foreign body sensation, like something's in your eyes, like a gritty, sandy feeling, um, difficulty tolerating contact lenses, um, uh, the eye going in out of focus, like when you're uh, either reading or looking at distance, things are clear, and then it gets blurry, and you blink sometimes, and it comes back into focus. You put a teardrop in, and it's, it comes back in focus. Um, this is a picture, you know, there's a, there's a number of things we see on the eye exam uh, when we're evaluating somebody for dry eyes. In a patient who has fairly significant dry eye, this is what it looks like when we use a special uh, uh, dye in our office, uh, what's called fluorescein dye. So fluorescein is the vegetable-based based yellow-green dye that we use for a number of things, including checking the eye pressure. Um, but one of the useful things about fluorescein is if you have dry eye, it sticks to the areas where there's dry spots on the cornea. And so what you're seeing in the lower part of the cornea, those, those fluorescent green areas that's where that dye is being taken up by, uh, by a dry eye. So that's a telltale sign of something we see in the office with dry eye. Um, causes of dry eye, so some people's eyes just don't make enough tears. There, it can be associated with a number of autoimmune inflammatory conditions like um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, thyroid disease, diabetes, 
There's a condition called Sjogren syndrome, um, which is an uh, inflammatory autoimmune disease that, that sometimes is associated with things like rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes is a separate entity unto itself that can cause dry eye and dry mouth. Um, a number of medicines can cause dry, um, dry eyes, um, including antihistamines. That's probably the most common one that we see. Um, so in the allergy season, your eyes are itchy and then they get more dry because you're using antihistamines. Um, in the winter, things are almost always worse, worse with dry eyes because of the lack of humidity. And especially if you if you spend a lot of time in, um, in forced air heat. Um, the, a very common medical condition that I see that can lead to really terrible dry eyes is Parkinson's because of a, a significantly reduced blink rate weight in that condition. People just not blink enough, uh, oftentimes when they have Parkinson's. Um, eyelid malpositions. And um, mybomian gland dysfunction, which is just the mybomian glands are a, are a row of tear producing glands right behind your eyelashes. Um, and when they're dysfunctional, they your tears tend to evaporate very quickly. That probably is one of probably the most common cause of dry eye um, is actually um, uh, dysfunctional tears due to things like mybomian gland dysfunction, um, which is oftentimes uh, associated with rosacea skin condition. So how do we treat dry eyes? The simplest way of treating dry eyes is, is just using over-the-counter artificial teardrops, cysteine or refresh. Um, there's a new one called Ivisia that has something called hyaluronic acid in it, which is good. If you're using the teardrops more than three times a day, I usually recommend preservative-free tears. The preservatives don't cause further irritation. Those are the ones that come in little individual vials. Um, the, um, the, the prescription eye drops can be very effective. Uh, the one that's been around the longest is Restasis. There are now several generic formulations of cyclosporin available as well. Um, unfortunately, they're not always cheaper and insurance coverage of these drops is not always great. Um, uh, Zydra, which is a similar anti-inflammatory drop that acts on the tear surface. Um, we can put in something called punctal plugs. Those are little plastic pieces that block the tears from flowing out of your eyes. Um, so it keeps your tears on your eye surface longer. Um, in really severe cases, we sometimes will do a course of steroid eye drops um, or autologous serum, where we actually have you um, get your uh, to have a blood draw. They spin off the hemoglobin and they take your serum and make we make it into an eye drop um, that can be given for really refractory dry eyes. And there's something that I've actually become a big fan of, which came out in the last year or two, something called Tirvaya. Tirvaya is actually a nose spray. And it actually stimulates tear production by stimulating nerves in your nose. So you just spray it in each, each nostril. Usually you sneeze afterwards a couple of times, um, but it really does work well uh, for helping with, with dry eyes. Again, uh, another issue with this is insurance coverage for this medicine. It hasn't been out for a long time. And so insurance coverage of this is, has, is not great just yet. Hopefully that will change. Um, moving along, um, the next topic I wanted to uh, discuss today are, are floaters. Um, this is just a picture here. Um, of a bunch of little amoeba-like floaters, um, which is what we're, we're talking about here. And most people have experienced these at some point. Um, there are several different things that can cause uh, floaters in our eyes, but they're all due to something going on in the vitreous, which I'll show you a picture in, the minute, uh, in a minute, um, which is the gel that fills the back part of the eye, so between your lens and the retina. Um, one thing are just what are called vitreous um, synergesis or, or benign floaters, and those are little condensed areas of hyaluronic acid and collagen in the gel in the back of the eye, much more common in people who are very nearsighted to get them. And that's like when you see these little amoeba-like things and you kind of move and they move around in your eye. Um, and they're more prominent usually on a bright sunny day, on a bright background against the computer screen. Um, another thing that can cause floaters, which we'll talk a little more about in a minute, is something called a PVD or a posterior vitreous detachment, which is where the gel in the back of the eye has pulled away from the retina. Um, generally, floaters are, are, can be very annoying, but they are generally benign. So what do we do about floaters? Typically nothing. They usually get better. Um, they usually become more tolerable with time. Um, if you develop a, a PVD, the vitreous separation, some people will have terrible floaters from that that just don't go away. Their brain never really gets used to them. Um, and for those cases, there are some treatments that can be done, but they're controversial and usually reserved for floaters that are just incredibly bothersome and really affect the vision. One is doing a surgery called a vitrectomy. Um, where literally the gel in the back of the eye is removed by a retina specialist. Um, so it's, it's a surgery. There's some risks to doing the surgery. And there's also a laser treatment, something called the YAG vitriolysis, where you can laser those floaters. It's also controversial with any of these things. There's a small risk of a retinal tear developing. With a laser vitriolysis, there are reports of people having a large floater zapped by the laser and then just ending up with a lot of smaller floaters. Um, 
But the, so there are some things that can be done in, ex, in extreme cases, but generally we just monitor them and make sure you don't have any holes or tears in the retina. It's important to get your eyes checked out if you have a sudden change in floaters, especially if it's accompanied by flashes, to make sure there's no holes or tears in the retina. Um, so speaking about flashes, so flashes are when people describe seeing a lightning bolt um, or stars in the vision. And these are commonly associated with a, a posterior vitreous detachment, which is when the gel in the back there actually pulls away from the retina. That's a normal age-related thing we'll talk about in a second. It happens to everybody at some point. It can be retinal, uh, flashes can be a, a symptom associated with retinal tears or detachment because the flashes are simply how our brain perceives pulling or traction on the retina. Sometimes people will get uh, flash-like uh, disturbances with ocular migraines, but more commonly they describe it as jagged lines in the vision um, or like a heat wave in the vision um, rather than just lightning bolt flashes. It's important to see an ophthalmologist, as I mentioned, if you do have new flashes or, or a big increase in floaters. So the posterior vitreous detachment, which, which I'd mentioned, is something that happens to pretty much everybody at some point in their life. Um, and it's the older we get, the more common it is. You can have them in early age, um, we've, I've seen it in teenagers and people in their 20s, um, but with every decade of life, the incidence of this increases. And the symptoms of this is typically a sudden onset of flashes and floaters. What's causing the posterior vitreous attachment? The vitreous gel when we're born is this gelatinous substance, and it liquefies over time, and it's attached to the retina at various points. At some point, it just acutely separates from the retina after it liquefies, and that causes flashing as a pulling on the retina, and floaters, which we can actually see when we, you look in your eye, which are those areas of the vitreous that were previously attached to the retina that are now floating around, and that's why you see floaters with this. Um, and it usually occurs in one eye at a time, but oftentimes will occur in the second eye pretty soon after in the next six months or a couple of years. Risk factors for PVD, they happen to everybody at some point, So, but it's the more common as we get older. People who are nearsighted and very nearsighted tend to have this occur at an earlier age due to some structural things with the eye being longer and the composition of the gel in the back of the eye. Oftentimes, if you have an eye trauma, you're going to develop this vitreous floater, and they're more common following any type of eye surgery or laser treatment. The symptoms of a PVD are these photopsias, which are camera-like flashes, usually in the periphery of the vision. Um, they're often worse in dim light, um, and usually, but not always, accompanied by new floating spots in the vision. About 10% of the time, when you have a vitreous separation, you can, will develop a retinal tear. I think it's probably more like 5%. The textbook answer is 10%. Um, and so that's why it's important to get your eyes checked if you have a new onset of flashing lights. Um, it doesn't have to be that second in the ER, but, but you know, within 24 to 48 hours. A retinal tear is something that's serious but treatable, especially if it's treated quickly, um, because it can turn into a retinal detachment if it's untreated. Um, sometimes when the vitreous pulls away from the retina, it can cause um, a hemorrhage or bleeding uh, in the back of the eye. Um, this happens less than 10% of the time, but when you have bleeding from this vitreous detachment in the, in the gel in the back of the eye, there's a much higher risk of a retinal tear. So um, if you have a lot of dark spots and cobwebs in the vision um, with flashes and floaters, there's more of a chance that you may have some bleeding in the back of the eye, maybe a higher chance of there being a retinal tear. Um, so what should you do if you start getting a big change in flashes and floaters? Occasional floaters, amoeba-like things, probably not a big deal, but big increase in floating spots, big increase in flashing lights, especially accompanied by a change in the vision. You should try to see an ophthalmologist. Um, if there's a PVD uh, present and there's no retinal holes or tears, we typically redilate in a month or six weeks after to make sure you don't develop one. If there are tears in the retina, those can be treated by a retina specialist with laser in their office. Um, so this is a picture sort of a cross section of the eye here. And what you're seeing there is the gelatinous uh, vitreous in the process of pulling away from the retina. Um, and so that's on the right side uh, of the, in the, the picture in the back of the eye. Um, and then here's actually some interesting things. These are the three of these are actual photos of what we see when you have a PVD or a, a vitreous detachment in the back of the eye. Um, so what you see there is that, that ring there, the top two left images, and that's something called the Weiss ring. And so what's interesting, when people come in saying, oh, I'm seeing this ring of floaters, or these floating spots, we see the same thing. So we look in your eye, we can actually see those floaters that you see. And that's how we know that you've had a vitreous detachment. Um, the bottom left picture represents a retinal tear. So you can see how this occurs. You get a flap in the retina from that gel pulling away from it. It can just tug on the retina and cause a retinal tear here. Um, so that's the an overview of flashes, floaters, and PVDs. So moving on to the next um, the next topic, um, we're going to talk about something that I see uh, pretty much every day, which are people that are having difficulty with glare 
from headlights or ca uh, car headlights, sunlight. Um, and these are this is a typical symptom of cataracts. So you can see in this picture here, the starbursts, the halos around lights. And they're normal, even people who don't have cataracts, when you start getting a lot of that and makes it really unbearable to drive at night, especially in the rain, there very well could be something like a cataract causing that. So a cataract is a progressive opacity, opacification of the lens in the eye. Um, it's usually age-related, though it can be related to some other things like diabetes, steroid medication use, trauma. Sometimes people are born with cataracts. Normal age-related cataracts usually um, start around 60, but they're uh, oftentimes quite a bit longer until they're symptomatic and require treatment. And even if you have a cataract, there's no need to do anything about it until it's really having an impact on your vision. There are some rare exceptions that where we need to do surgery if it's causing a certain form of glaucoma or if it's so bad that we can't see the retina. Um, but generally, it's not the surgery is not required unless it's causing a problem um, and impacting your activities of daily living. Here's another cross section through the eye, and you can see that lens um, in the front center of the eye, which is where the cataract develops. It's a crystalline, clear structure when we're born that just becomes cloudy and hazy as we as we get older, um, and that is the the cataract there. Um, so the typical symptoms of cataract, as I mentioned, the by far the most common reason why people come to me um, requiring cataract surgery is difficulty with driving, and especially driving at night due to glare and halos. People also report just generally blurry vision, more trouble need, uh, needing a lot more light to read, and sometimes people just report things look really dull and faded and hazy. Um, so these are some pictures. On the top of this diagram, a clear lens is, is a clear crystalline structure. The cloudy uh, cataract is where it starts to become yellow, hazy. Sometimes it gets white. Sometimes a, uh, you can develop a white cataract, which is in the bottom left, and those are, um, are uh, interesting. Um, they're a little more of a challenge to remove sometimes. The, on the right side, that's a, a, what we call a brunescent cataract, which is a cataract where it's become really yellow, dense, and hazy. And I see those very, very commonly. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that um, would cause, um, should cause a lot of um, um, decreased contrast sensitivity in glare. Um, so as I mentioned, cataract surgery is indicated once it's impacting your activities of daily living. Um, if both eyes are needed, which sometimes they are, sometimes it's not required to do both eyes at the same time. If only one eye is symptomatic and the other one's not bad, you don't necessarily need cataract surgery in both eyes. If they're both required, I usually do them two weeks apart. Um, usually it's somewhere between one to four weeks apart. And we remove that cloudy lens and we virtually always put a new lens implant in the eye. Otherwise, you need Coke bottle glasses to see. Um, it's common. It's safe. Um, there are risks with cataract surgery, like any other surgery, um, generally very effective, um, and the risks are, of complications are quite small. Um, it's a same-day outpatient surgery. It usually takes um, usually takes me about 15 minutes to do a cataract surgery, sometimes a little longer, if it's a different kind of cataract. Um, it's not a laser surgery, but there is something called laser-assisted cataract surgery, where a laser is used in helping break apart the cataract and do some other steps of the surgery. Um, so... A really common question we uh, that I face is what kind of lens implant should I have at the time of cataract surgery? So we used to have very few options. When I was in training, there really weren't that many options for lens implants, and now there's a lot. Um, and so it makes it a little trickier um, because there's not one right answer for everybody. There's a lot of different options, and it depends on a lot of different factors. So a conventional lens implant is what's called a monofocal lens implant, meaning it corrects one focal point. Um, so we can correct your vision for near, we can correct your vision for distance. Conventionally, we correct your vision for far away, and you will need reading glasses after. We could correct your vision for near, and then you'll need glasses for far away. Um, there's another option called monovision. We correct one eye for near, one eye for distance. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, if possible, if we're considering that, we, if it's possible to do a trial of that with a contact lens first, uh, we'd like to do that to see if your eyes, your brain will tolerate it and will like it. Um, if you have astigmatism, which means that your eye is shaped a little more like a football than a basketball, we can correct that at the time of surgery using a special lens implant called a toric lens. They're not covered by insurance. And if you have significant astigmatism and you don't use a toric lens, it can still be corrected with glasses afterwards. The other categories of uh, lens implants are what are called presbyopic lens implants. And there's an increasing number of those available. We have what are called multifocal or some people call them trifocal lens implants. Um, the one that I tend to use in that category most is something called the panoptics lens. The panoptics lens is a lens that helps us see close up, intermediate, and distance with one lens implant. Um, 
it works very well. It's not, it's not a guarantee. Any of these lenses, no matter what, there's a chance you'll need glasses. It's not an exact science. About 20% of people we put a lens implant in will end up more than a half adapter off from what the formulas predict. So it's not an exact science, but we're usually pretty close. Um, so that's, that's an option that can correct everything. The drawback to those lenses are they're not covered by insurance and they're not inexpensive. And they also can create a little bit of glare or halo effect because of the way that they that the lenses are created. There's another category of presbyopic lenses that we refer to as extended depth of focus, lens, uh, focus lenses. I'm a fan of these also. These lenses um, give you, rather than single focal point, they extend that depth of focus. I find that they're very good for intermediate vision, for example, computer range and good for distance. They don't perform well for, for as well for close up. So most people we put this in, the expectation is they're gonna need reading glasses for close up reading, but there's a very good chance they won't need it on the computer, which with a conventional lens implant, you probably will. Um, sometimes we can tweak things a little bit by making the non-dominant eye a little nearsighted, um, or even in some cases we put a multifocal lens in one eye and an extended depth of focus lens in the dominant eye um, to try to minimize some of the side effects of the, of the, of the uh, multifocal lenses. The, the, a newer option that I'm very excited about, and I'm really, really, really hoping to get soon, I've been following this technology for 20 years since I was a resident when it was first in development, is something called a light adjustable lens, which is now owned by a company called RX Sight. It just got, it got approved by the FDA a year and a half ago or so. Um, it's been a long time in development and it's very well tested. Um, and what it is, it's a really, a really fascinating technology. Um, the light adjustable lens is a lens that has these polymers in it and the tiny lens that we put in that are that are um, uh, uh, basically can be reshaped or moved using the ultraviolet light in the office. So what's amazing about that is that I mentioned before is that cataract surgery is not an exact science and there's about a 20% chance that you're gonna end up a little bit off from the predicted um, target with cataract surgery. What this does is it kind of allows us to, to fix that. Um, in the office after surgery. So the, um, we have a special, if we, um, the light adjustable lens involves, this, there's a special ultraviolet light unit that you have in your office. You put the lens in, and then after the eye heals up a little bit, we see where things are. And we can basically use that UV light to adjust the power of the lens implant in the office, um, which is really wild. So we can basically get it exactly where you want it. So if we're off by a little bit, we can target it uh, perfectly with that lens. And you, can, you uh, can do several adjustments until you lock it in. Once you lock it in, there's a lock-in treatment, you can't adjust it anymore, um, but, um, uh, but you can really adjust the power. What a lot of people are doing with this is doing that a mini monovision, leaving one eye a little bit more for near and, and using the other one for distance. And the cool thing is that if you don't like that, then you can actually just treat it away. You can say, you know what? You don't like the monovision. It's, you don't like the optics of it don't, aren't great for you. Then using that UV light, we can actually change the lens shape and get you corrected just for distance. Um, it also treats astigmatism. In fact, um, that's the main indication for it. So it gives us an extremely precise way to correct astigmatism. Um, I, it's more, more precise than using a toric lens, which I use right now and they're wonderful, but the light adjustable lens is kind of, um, it's, it's sort of a fail-proof way of treating that. So um, I've put in a request uh, to get this and we're working right now. Um, I'm hoping that the hospital will approve my request and, uh, and we'll be able to use this lens soon. Not a lot of people have it in this area yet. I don't think anybody does in Bergen County. It is caught on like wildfire in California where the company is based out of my friends that are using it and have described it as witch medicine because it is just unbelievably uh, accurate. It's exactly what you want um, for, for the lens power. So I'm hoping we'll have access to this technology in the coming months, knock on wood. Um, these are some pictures of the, of the lens implants that we use. Um, the ones with the little dots on them, or those are toric lenses, and then we line them up to correct the astigmatism. The one in the top left is an older model of a, a multifocal lens, and you can see those little rings on it. Those are what allow us to see near and intermediate with a multifocal lens, but they also are what create, can create some halo or, gl or glare with that lens. Most people don't have a problem with it. When they have a little glare halo, it usually goes away with time. However, occasionally, patients are very bothered by that. We've had that in our experience as well, where every now and then, uh, we'll have a patient who um, is just finds to, there to be a lot of bothersome glare or halo with those lens. It's rare. It's probably less than 5%, but if it happens to you, it doesn't matter. It's, it can be very problematic. Um, and in some cases even require removing the lens. Now, I don't want to scare people off from doing them because the vast majority of people who use those lens implants are very, very satisfied with them and can see near intermediate distance and would, and highly recommend it to their friends and family. Um, 
but they're they're not a perfect solution. There isn't really one yet for near distance and intermediate. Um, this is a, uh, a, a what I think is a really cool slide about the light adjustable lens. Um, so this kind of shows how that works. So there's this adjustment beam. So the lens, this is the lens would be in your eye, but this is what it looks like if it's explanted from the eye. And the the light delivery device is directed by the surgeon in our office to reach to to and it moves these macromers. It's pretty simple from our standpoint. We just plug in what prescription we want and it just does it. Um, but this is how it works, and it actually reshapes that lens in the office just sitting at a special um, UV light. It's not even a laser. It's it's really cool. Um, Okay, so moving on to the final topic I wanted to uh, to discuss today before we um, uh, take some questions is uh, is a co very common issue um, in the aging eye, which is macular degeneration. Um, so macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss for people um, over age fifty. Um, it typically causes um, blurry, reduced central vision, um, and the severity is extremely variable. Many people have macular degeneration and never have any symptoms or any vision loss from it. They can have mild macular degeneration and, and go their entire life with that and have zero impact from it. Um, on the far end of that are um, uh, our advanced dry or wet macular degeneration, where you can have, which I'll talk about in a minute, which can lead to profound central vision loss. Um, the cause is not entirely clear. Definitely, um, there are a number of genetic factors and, uh, and, um, and family uh, history is, is a strong uh, risk factor for it. Um, but also we see people that have the genes that have a strong family history and don't develop macular degeneration. So there's a lot of things, probably environmental factors, diet that we don't understand. Smoking is a big time risk factor for severe macular degeneration um, unequivocally. Um, it's a, it's, it's the, probably the most, the biggest thing you can do to modify your risk of macular degeneration is, is if you smoke, quit smoking. Um, um, and also just general health issues like um, cardiovascular health, uh, high cholesterol, heart disease are also associated with macular degeneration. Um, there are two types, and um, I get a lot of questions about these, and there's a lot of confusion about what these two types of macular degeneration really mean. Um, so there's dry and wet, and people typically think of dry as good, or not good, but less bad, and wet as bad. And generally, there is truth to that. So most people have macular degeneration of the dry form. It's 80% of cases. You get these protein clumps underneath the retina, that can lead to retinal thinning. Um, and, and many people with dry macular degeneration don't develop vision loss. The, however, dry macular degeneration can turn into wet form. And wet form is almost always preceded by dry. It's usually you start with dry, and then if you're going to develop wet, it starts with dry macular degeneration. Wet macular degeneration is when you get damage to these layers in the retina that causes new blood vessels to grow uh, into the retina and bleed in the retina. And that's why it's called wet macular degeneration, bleeding and exudate of proteins and fluid, which causes vision loss and scarring. Now, you can have dry macular degeneration with severe profound vision loss without developing wet macular degeneration. Um, you need, that's due to atrophy of the retinal tissue. Um, and that is very frustrating because wet macular degeneration, we have some treatments for Dry, unfortunately, if you have debilitating vision loss from severe dry macular degeneration, we don't have great treatments for it. There's a new, there's a medication that is likely to be approved um, in the coming year by the FDA. It's not a cure. It's just if you have what's called geographic atrophy, which is where you get loss of retinal tissue because of dry macular degeneration, severe dry macular degeneration, it's been shown to slow that progression down. It doesn't get, stop it. It just can slow down the progression of that condition. Um, and that's not yet FDA approved. It hopefully should be soon. Um, this is just a picture of, uh, of dry macular degeneration. And this is what I would call severe dry macular degeneration. Um, on the left, this is a picture of the center of the retina that the round structure on the right side of those images is the optic nerve. And you can see those little yellow dots there. And those are what are called drusen, which are the pathognomonic finding, the typical finding of, of macular degeneration. And they're those clumps of protein under the retina. On the right-hand side, this is an image of what's called an OCT. It's an image we do in our office. And those lumpy, bumpy areas are a cross-section of those drusen. Um, so a patient like this probably does not have vision loss, um, but they might have some distortion and decreased quality of vision. This patient does not have the um, the severe dry macular degeneration where there's atrophy of the retinal tissue, but somebody who has this amount of those large drus in those lumpy, bumpy areas is at risk, significant risk for developing wet macular degeneration, should be monitored fairly closely. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute, one thing we can do uh, also to mitigate that risk a little bit. Um, 
um, uh, here's some more pictures of dry macular degeneration on the left. This is a patient that would have more, much more severe vision loss from dry macular degeneration. Um, you can see this area that's, uh, that's highlighted is what's called geographic atrophy. And that's right in the center of the retina is where that area, that's that yellow kind of um, atrophied spot in the retina is. And it's right in the center of the vision. So a patient who has this has significant profound central vision loss. There's no bleeding, but you can see the retinal layers on that cross section of that OCT, which is on the bottom left, are thinned out and worn away. The photoreceptors, the rods and cones are probably basically destroyed in the central retina. And unfortunately, that's going to be some profound vision loss. On the right hand, the central image here, this is a picture of somebody who has active bleeding from wet macular degeneration. And so there's a hemorrhage there um, due to damage from that, the, the dry macular degeneration causing bleeding and wearing away the retinal tissue. Um, and you can see in that image on the, the central, uh, the bottom part of the center screen, there are some dark spaces which represent fluid and hemorrhage. And that is something that's treatable with injections in the eye. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the symptoms of macular degeneration, often it's asymptomatic. So in people that have mild dry macular degeneration, typically there's not gonna be any symptoms from it. Um, when you start having uh, more severe disease, you're gonna start noticing um, maybe lines are wavy or not straight. And you can have that with wet or dry, but if there's a sudden change, it warrants seeing an ophthalmologist. Um, blind spots, trouble recognizing faces, central visual distortion. Um, and we diagnose it on exam and by doing some ancillary testing. Dry macular degeneration, as I mentioned, right now, the treatment for that is, is, disease, is risk modification. So if you have mild dry macular degeneration, we just recommend having a diet rich in green leafy vegetables may not definitely, but may be helpful in slowing the progression of this because they're high in antioxidants. Um, there has been several large studies proving the benefit of using something called AREDS2 vitamins, vitamin C, E, zinc, copper, lutein, zeaxanthin, it's a bunch of antioxidants. And those are indicated not for everybody who dropped with macular degeneration. There's, there've been, they've been shown to be beneficial if you have moderate dry macular degeneration or worse. So we typically don't recommend taking them if you have mild dry macular degeneration or just a family history, they're not proven in that setting. But if you have moderate dry macular degeneration or wet macular degeneration, there's a, uh, a benefit. And that benefit is about a 25% risk reduction of converting to the wet form by taking those vitamins. Um, if you have wet macular degeneration, the typical treatment for that nowadays is a series of injections, very, usually very long-term, um, what are termed anti-VEGF injections that are done by a retina doctor. Um, and this sounds barbaric. It's actually not as painful. I've never had it done myself, but I've done the injections. Um, and the patients have reported that it's not nearly as bad as you'd think it, it would be. Um, the needle is extremely tiny um, and it's very, very quick. Um, and it's not, it's sort of like a tiny, like a small pinch. So it's usually very well tolerated. It's done right in the office. Um, every, it, the, the frequency is anywhere from four to 12 weeks, depending on the, the treatment, the medication, the response to treatment. Um, and um, these are basically medications that block an antibody, which contributes to the bleeding in the back of the eye. So that's been a whirlwind overview of some eye diseases that can occur as we get older. Um, and um, I appreciate your listening. I know that was a little quick and uh, I mm -hmm. apologize. It was a lot to get through in a short time, but I'd be happy to take a few questions. Oh, thank you so much, doctor. It was so comprehensive. Um, let me just go through a few questions. Um, yes, do um, somebody mentioned something about, do I need to be concerned about ocular migraines and what, what are the cause of these events? Okay, so great question. This is a, a really common issue that we see in the office all the time. So ocular migraines are related to migraine headaches. Um, you can have an ocular migraine with or without a headache. So a lot of patients present to us with ocular migraines where they get the visual symptoms without the headache because they don't necessarily know it's a migraine because it's just a visual symptom. Um, an ocular migraine is caused, or a migraine in general, by a blood vessel spasm in your brain. So it's not an eye problem, it's a brain problem. It can be a blood vessel spasm in the retina. That's called a retinal migraine as well. And it's a, a basically a blood, blood vessel constricts and then dilates. And it's that dilation that causes migraine symptoms. So when a migraine uh, involves your visual cortex, the vision part of your brain, which is a huge part of your brain, um, oftentimes you get these visual symptoms. And what people describe with that are shimmering lights. Um, sometimes there's zigzags in the vision. Sometimes it's like a circle with little zigzag shimmery things that sort of, they typically start in the center and then expand and move out to the side and go away, lasting 15 to 30 minutes. 
Oftentimes it's not always followed by a headache. I get them, so I know what they're, when people come in and are describing them, I'm a sufferer of ocular and regular migraines. I know what they're talking about. Um, but that's a classic pattern for, for ocular migraines and for migraine headaches, sometimes nausea with it as well, usually accompanied by some light sensitivity and a feeling of wanting to be alone, like left alone in a dark room to lie down. Um, the migraines are, are then uh, in and of themselves are not a serious uh, life-threatening condition. Um, but if you've never had migraines before and you have those symptoms, you should get checked out. First of all, to make sure it is a migraine. Um, and also just to see if there's anything else going on. There are some medications that can be used to treat migraines, especially if you have an aura beforehand. Um, some people would benefit from taking medicine as soon as they get the visual aura, um, and that can help diminish the, the headache afterwards. Um, they can be absolutely debilitating, and there's um, people that have chronic migraines. It a, it's, can be a really terrible thing. Um, there's a, a number of medications um, including uh, some people uh, who have refractory migraines do well with a series of Botox injections. Um, but yeah, that's something we see all the time that are uh, ocular migraines. Um, they're not, they're, they can't, they, they're not serious in and of themselves. Have there, however, there've been case reports of migraine sufferers developing TIAs, mini strokes um, because of the blood, probably because of that blood vessel spasm, presumably. Um, but that is rare and it's not a stroke when you have migraines different from a stroke. Thank you so much. Someone had a question about detached detached retina. Um, it's, if it's hereditary and um, is there vision loss as a result sometimes? Good question. So a retinal detachment, most commonly, there's several things that can cause a retinal detachment. Um, in, in our experience, the most common cause of retinal detachment is, um, is a, a tear in the retina, often from that PVD that we talked about. Having a family history of retinal detachments probably does increase your risk especially if it's associated with being nearsighted. So a lot of times you see family, families that have history of retinal detachments. And oftentimes it's, you have a parent who is very nearsighted, a minus seven, maybe a minus 10 even, developed the retinal detachment, much more common if people are very nearsighted. And then their child, same situation, long eye, nearsighted, are developing a retinal, retinal tear, retinal detachment. Um, having said that, most people of a family member who had a retinal detachment will not experience retinal detachment in their lifetime, but it probably is, is a risk factor for developing a retinal detachment. The key thing with retinal detachment is that it's treatable, uh, but it's important to seek care quickly because if you have, for example, a tear that hasn't detached yet, often that can be treated by laser in the office before it turns into a detachment. And a an, it can be earlier, to, it can be easier to treat a, um, a smaller detachment to preserve the vision than if the entire central retina detaches um, where there's a more risk of, uh, of continued vision loss. So it can be treated sometimes with laser, sometimes by injecting air in the eye with laser treatment, um, and uh, other times with, with a couple of different surgeries, if it's depending on the type of retinal detachment. Okay, thank you so much. Um, question about cataract surgery and artificial lens versus uh, natural lenses. And do you know anything about the natural lenses? No, there, anything there, about them? Mm -hmm. There, there are no. There's no natural lens. So the only, the only lens that can be implanted is a is an artificial lens um, that is made out of. Uh, there's a few different materials like acrylic and PMMA and silicone that are used, but they're all uh, they're all um, uh, manufactured uh, lenses. Okay. Uh, yeah, them. And do you know if the light adjustable lens is covered by insurance by any chance? It's not. No. There. No. Not. Any of so any of the so insurance will cover sort of the standard monofocal lens implant, insurances and Medicare will cover those. They don't cover astigmatism correcting and they don't cover any of the multifocals or the light adjustable lens, unfortunately. Um, okay. And the price for those is variable. It's usually somewhere for a standard toric lens. It depends on who does it and everything, but usually about $1,600 um, to uh, the light adjustable lens is probably, is most people are charging about $3,500 to $4,000 for the light adjustable lens. Wow. Um, is there, you know anything about an eye stroke? And what can be done for it? How to prevent it? It just depends. It, there's mm -hmm. there's so many different kinds of eye strokes. You can have a stroke to the optic nerve. You can have there's several different th uh, things that can cause a stroke to the retina. Um, but there are many different things that are that you can that you could that comp that could comprise what can be turned an eye stroke, um, mm -hmm. you know, like a like a what's called a central retinal artery occlusion. Um, you can have an optic uh, nerve stroke. Um, and so the, the risk factors are things like high blood pressure, um, having uh, comorbidities like carotid artery disease is a major risk factor for a retinal stroke. Um, 
probably things like diabetes as well. Um, there's a form of an optic nerve stroke that, that some people have an anatomical predisposition to have something called a non-arteritic ischemic anterior optic neuropathy, NAION, um, which unfortunately there's not a lot that can, uh, if you, that, that's sort of a bad luck thing where there's not much modifiable that can mitigate the risk of having it. That's not very common though. We don't see that that often. Um, but an eye stroke, you know, um, the, a retinal stroke um, or an optic nerve stroke can be due to an embolic event. Um, so that's why the carotid artery disease, heart disease, if you have an arrhythmia, it can lead to that. There's something very serious called giant cell arteritis, um, which can cause a uh, loss of perfusion to the optic nerve um, that's accompanied by um, some things like pain in your temples, pain while chewing. That's a very serious um, condition. But there's a lot of different things that can cause eye strokes in different parts of the eye. Okay. A um, couple of people are asking about glaucoma, how often you see that in your office, any new treatments? So yeah, glaucoma we see, I see every single day. It's probably the most common chronic eye disease that I treat. Uh, my colleague, my partner, Dr. Fuchs is a glaucoma specialist. Um, so glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. People think of glaucoma as eye pressure. It's actually not eye pressure. Um, it is a, a disease that causes damage to the nerve in the back of the eye. You can have elevated eye pressure and have glaucoma. You can have lower normal eye pressure and have glaucoma. Having higher eye pressure is a glaucoma risk factor. So commonly people who have glaucoma do have elevated eye pressure. The way that we treat glaucoma is by lowering the eye pressure, whether it's high or whether it's low to start, the way we treat it is by lowering the eye pressure. And there's several things that we can do to treat the pressure. One is in the most common thing is eye drops. And there's a whole host of different eye drops um, with varying efficacy and side effects. Um, sometimes we do a laser in the office for primary glaucoma, something called an SLT laser. There's a different kind of glaucoma called um, uh, narrow, narrow angle or angle closure glaucoma, where the fluid kind of builds up in the eye because it can't escape properly. That's treated differently by a laser called an iridotomy, where we make a little opening in the iris, also done in the office. We have a laser we used to do that. Um, and then there are surgical options. There's a growing number of what are called MIGs or minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries that we do. Uh, I do a couple of them. Dr. Fuchs does a lot of them. She, has, she does uh, any MIGs procedure you name it, she has experience doing them. Um, and these are minimally invasive surgeries often done at the same time of cataract surgery that add a very short time to the cataract surgery, but improve the outflow of the fluid from the eye. Then there's uh, some older surgeries, which are still required in some cases that are a little more invasive, something called the trabeculectomy um, and another one called the tube shunt. Those are a little more invasive, but there are a lot of surgical and uh, eye drop options for, for glaucoma. It's a chronic disease. It's not curable, but it's treatable. Okay, uh, so I want to quit, no, a couple questions about chronic dry eyes. Um, can they cause, uh, would chronic dry eyes cause retina tears? No. Or any other issues? No. Okay. no. It can cause other issues on the surface of the eye, um, like severe cases could lead to some corneal issues, um, like scarring and things like that. Not, not common, that would be severe dry eyes, but it won't, cannot contribute to any back of the eye problems. Um, okay. And what is the difference between macular degenerations and central vein retinal occlusion, CVRO? Unrelated, completely different. Unrelated? Okay. Yeah. So macular degeneration, when I spoke about a central retinal vein occlusion is basically obstruction through a vein in the back of the eye, oftentimes, but not always associated with high blood pressure. It can be associated with some other things like blood clotting disorders. Um, and that's basically where the blood, um, it, it, the, the, a vein becomes occluded. Um, and sometimes that happens for no good reason we're aware of. In fact, a lot of times that is a, um, it's just, we call it idiopathic. It's just kind mm -hmm. of bad luck. It can just happen from, uh, from time to time. Mm. Just a couple more questions. And uh, what treatment is available, if any, is available for eye condition caused by Hashimoto's mm. thyroiditis? Um, mm -hmm. Good question. So ha Hashimoto's, we sort of group together as far as the eye disease. Um, eye diseases that are caused by thyroid problems, Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, and then there's another form where, believe it or not, you have thyroid eye disease without the, the thyroid disease, which sounds kind of weird, but that can happen sometimes. Um, and um, the issue is that it's, a, it's an autoimmune condition, thyroid eye disease. Um, when you have Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, you have circulating antibodies that attack your thyroid, disease, thyroid and cause you to be hyper or hypothyroid, depending on the disease process. More commonly with hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, we see thyroid eye disease. And this is classically, we see pictures of people with bulging eyes, but the eyelids really far open. That's sort of classic thyroid eye disease. In reality, it's a huge spectrum from anywhere from having mild dry eyes 
to double vision, to the eyelids not opening or closing properly, to um, you know, to eye muscle conditions, to that whole that the more severe eye, you know, the eye sort of popping out of your head, thyroid eye disease. There are a whole host of things that can be done to treat, depending on the severity. Just if you have just dry eyes with thyroid eye disease, just simple things like artificial teardrops. We need to make sure if you have some dry eye, uh, thyroid eye disease that there's no signs of any compromise the optic nerve because if you have a lot of swelling around the tissue in the back of the eye from those antibodies um, causing inflammation on the eye muscles, uh, the most severe cases you can end up with what's called an optic neuropathy or eye, uh, optic nerve compromise. That's usually more severe uh, thyroid um, eye disease. And that's um, not, we don't see that often, but it can happen. Um, Sometimes surgery needs to be done. So for example, the eyes are really bulging um, and not getting better. That can be treated sometimes with steroids or even sometimes radiation, but oftentimes require um, a surgery. And there's a whole host of them depending on whether it's something with the eyelids, the eye muscles or bulging of the eyes. There is a, an, um, a medicine now. Um, it's sort of something similar to what rheumatologists use called Tepeza. And Tepeza um, is a medicine that's actually can be very um, effective in treating thyroid eye disease, active thyroid eye disease. Um, and it's an, it's an infusion, um, a series of infusions actually. Um, and um, it's something um, that's, it's very, very expensive. Um, I believe a course of treatment costs about $300,000 last time I checked. Um, but for somebody who has, um, and, and getting, as you can imagine, getting approval from insurance is difficult. And so the problem is sometimes somebody really has optic nerve compromise that is, this isn't an option because it'll take too long to get approved and you have to have surgery to save that optic nerve. Um, but for somebody who has um, severe um, or significant um, um, thyroid eye disease um, that's active thyroid eye disease is not really um, burned out, although there's some questions about whether it can be used in that setting too that's being investigated, um, the, the tepeza can, be, uh, can also be an option. Okay, and uh, just a question about um, are cataract surgeries performed in your office or at the hospital where are they typically... Uh, so we do our cataract surgeries at the Lucko Pavilion Outpatient Surgery Center. So it's a, you know, it's an outpatient surgery. Most people operate at some form of an ambulatory surgery center. So we do them at, at Lucko, um, it's, which is a phenomenal place to have cataract surgery. I've operated a number of places. It's my favorite. Um, they, the staff is amazing there. Um, they are really, really into the cataract surgery. A number of doctors work there. So they have a really nice, um, they, they have any instrument that you can imagine to do it. So it's, it's a great place for surgeons to operate. We have, they have fantastic equipment, uh, extremely well-trained staff. Um, the surgery itself takes me about 15 minutes and it, they're extremely efficient there. Um, you go home to usually about 20 minutes after the surgery, you're, 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 you're gone with just a shield over the eye. I don't use an injection in the eye to numb the eye. All I use are, are eye drops and a little medicine in the eye. And the anesthesiologist will get you a little sleepy using usually a medicine called Versed. So you'll hear us talking but you're completely comfortable during the surgery. It's, it's virtually painless, um, pretty much is painless. You just feel a little cold water on the eye. You don't see a knife come into your eye. You see some weird shapes and colors. Um, and then you go home about 20 minutes after it's done. Great. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, a great, it's a great surgery. People usually at the end of the surgery ask, that's it, you're done. Um, and the vision the day after counter surgery sometimes is good. Sometimes it's actually pretty uh, blurry the first day after, and that can be normal. It can take a few days for the vision to clear up. Great. And just one more question, um, then we have to stop. But once um, one has a retina tear, can it happen again? Is that common or? Yeah. It's not common, but it can happen again. So it's not common. Um, it's more common in people that have something else going on, whether being somebody, for example, who's very nearsighted, it means you have a very long eye and your retina sort of on stretch. Um, for example, that's, those patients are a little more predisposed to having a retinal tear. If you have a condition called lattice retinal degeneration, also associated with nearsightedness, um, where you get thin areas in the peripheral retina that have a, a risk of, of, of causing retinal tears there. So there are people that have multiple holes or tears in the retina for sure. Um, most people don't who have a retinal tear. Usually it's a one-time thing, but we for sure see people that have multiple retinal tears. And it's not a bad idea if they've had a retinal tear, at least for a little while after, maybe for a few years at least, to also follow with a retinal specialist to, um, to, to keep an eye on things. That's a great, great suggestion. Uh, people are saying, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Yeah. Truly, Dr. Uh, Benderson, really great to uh, have you with us. Dr. Yeah. Benderson, again, is at the VMG in Ridgewood. Um, and at this point, if you could, you know, 